ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ಟೈಮ್ ದ ಟಾಕ್ ನಾನು ಕೂಗ್ನ ನ್ಯೂಸ್ ನಾವು ತುಂಬ ಜನ ಇಂಟರ್ವ್ಯೂ ಮಾಡಿದ್ದೀವಿ ಬಟ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಹಾನರ್ಡ್ ಟು ಇಂಟ್ರೊಡ್ಯೂಸ್ ಆರ್ ಗೆಸ್ಟ್ ಟುಡೇ ಹಿ ಇಸ್ ದ ಸನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಆರ್ಮಿ ಕಮಾಂಡರ್ ಆಫ್ ಫ್ರೀ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಹಿ ಈಸ್ ಸರ್ವ್ಡ್ ಇನ್ ದಿ ಏರ್ ಫೋರ್ಸ್ ಆಸ್ ಅನ್ ಏರ್ ಮಾರ್ಷಲ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಪ್ರಿವ್ಲೆಜ್ಡ್ ಟು ಟಾಕ್ ಟು ಮಿಸ್ಟರ್ ನಂದಕರಿಯಪ್ಪ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಸರ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಅ ಪ್ರಿವ್ಲೆಜ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಫಾರ್ ಯೋರ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಸರ್ ಸರ್ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ ಲೆಟ್ ಮಿ ಟಾಕ್ ಟು ಯು ಅಬೌಟ್ ಯೋರ್ ಚೈಲ್ಡ್ಹುಡ್ ಹೌ ವಾಸ್ ಯೋರ್ ಚೈಲ್ಡ್ಹುಡ್ ಬೀಂಗ್ ಅ ಸನ್ ಆಫ್ ಅ ಲೆಜೆಂಡ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹೌ ವಾಸ್ ಯೋರ್ ಚೈಲ್ಡ್ಹುಡ್ ವರ್ ಟು ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ವಿತ್ ಮೈ ಫಾದರ್ ವಾಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಅ ಲೆಜೆಂಡ್ ವೆನ್ ಐ ವಾಸ್ ಅ ಚೈಲ್ಡ್ ಓಕೆ ಐ ವಾಸ್ ಅ ಟಿಪಿಕಲ್ ಆರ್ಮಿ ಬ್ರ್ಯಾಟ್ ಮೂವ್ಡ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಪ್ಲೇಸ್ ಟು ಪ್ಲೇಸ್ ವಿತ್ ಮೈ ಫಾದರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಐ ಡೋಂಟ್ ರಿಮೆಂಬರ್ ಟೂ ಮಚ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಟ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಐ ವಾಸ್ ಮಚ್ ಟು ಯಂಗ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹಿ ವಾಸ್ ಐದರ್ ಹಿ ವಾಸ್ ಇನ್ ಮೆಸೋಪಟೇಮಿಯಾ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಎಟ್ ದಿ ಎಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಔ ಟು ವಾಸ್ ದಿ ಎಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಸೆಕೆಂಡ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ವಾರ್ ಹಿ ವಾಸ್ ಇನ್ ಬರ್ಮ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದೆನ್ ಆಸ್ ಅ ಬ್ರಿಗೇಡಿಯರ್ ಹಿ ಸರ್ವ್ಡ್ ಇನ್ ದಿ ವಾಟ್ ಆರ್ ನೋನ್ ಆ್ಯಸ್ ಅ ನಾರ್ತ್ ವೆಸ್ಟ್ ಫ್ರಂಟಿಯರ್ ಪ್ರಾವಿನ್ಸಸ್ ಆಫ್ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಟು ಡೇಸ್ ಪಾಕಿಸ್ತಾನ್ ಸೊ ಮೈ ಚೈಲ್ಡ್ಹುಡ್ ರೆಮಿನಿಸೆನ್ಸ್ ಇಸ್ ವೆರಿ ಫ್ಲೀಟಿಂಗ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಐ ಸ್ಪೆಂಟ್ ಬೋ ಐ ವೆಂಟ್ ಬೋರ್ಡಿಂಗ್ ಸ್ಕೂಲ್ ವೆರಿ ಐಲಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದೆನ್ ಆಟೋಮ್ಯಾಟಿಕ್ಲಿ ಇಟ್ ವಾಸ್ ನೋಟ್ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ ಆಫ್ ಎನಿ ಅದರ್ ಚಾಯ್ಸ್ ಬಟ್ ಐ ವಾಸ್ ಎಫ್ ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ಇಂಟೆಂಡೆಡ್ ಜಾಯ್ನಿಂಗ್ ದಿ ಆರ್ಮ್ ಫೋರ್ಸಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಐ ಸೂನ್ ಆಸ್ ಐ ವಾಸ್ ಥ್ರೂ ವಿತ್ ಸ್ಕೂಲ್ ಐ ಜಾಯ್ನ್ ದಿ ಜಾಯ್ನ್ ಸರ್ವಿಸಸ್ ವಿಂಗ್ ದೆನ್ ಇನ್ ಡೆರಡೂನ್ ವಿಚ್ ಗಾಟ್ ಬಿ ನೋನ್ ಆ್ಯಸ್ ದಿ ಮೂವ್ ಟು ಕಲೆಕ್ ವಾಸ್ಲ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ನೋನ್ ಆ್ಯಸ್ ಅ ನ್ಯಾಷನಲ್ ಡಿಫೆನ್ಸ್ ಅಕಾಡೆಮಿ ಸೊ ರಿಯಲಿ ಸ್ಪೀಕಿಂಗ್ ದಿಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಮಚ್ ಫಾರ್ ಚೈಲ್ಡ್ಹುಡ್ ದಟ್ ಐ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ರಿಯಲಿ ರೆಮಿನಿಸ್ ಓವರ್ Yeah. how how was your relationship with your father very formal uh my father was brought up in the um, with the belief that children should be seen and not heard and a- a- as a result uh it, it was something that um, um you know conditioned uh my life a and b it happened that father was also from the time that i was age 7 or 8 he was a single parent and um, he was um, busy d- being and attending to his profession of arms as a soldier and so i didn't really get to spend too much time with him um i did spend whenever i got a vacation spend it with his siblings his uncle or his or his brother or his sister but very little time did i really spend with my father okay what about your mother sir Well my mother and fa- par- my parents were divorced when I was 45 at the age in 1945 sorry and uh, so I didn't see very much uh, of her there after and I can't really say I was too young for her to have any kind of effect or impact on on my on my on my life okay so uh, as 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 you said uh, the effect of mom and dad was very little for you now, how did you guide yourself to being a successful adult Well I don't know if I guided myself I think it was the environment in which I lived uh, as my father's son as a as son of an army officer and uh, then it was uh, it was uh, it was a given uh, that there was no other option but I would join the armed forces um I had at one time wanted to join the navy but because I'm so abysmally poor in 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 uh, mathematics there's no way I could uh, join there um the option then was between the air force and the navy and the army now i didn't want to join the army because i would always be i would live under my father's shadow a- and be always known as my father's son uh, and therefore anything that i said uh, you know acts of omission or commission if i can use that phrase would um, be attributed and sort of lo- either looked up on or looked down upon as um, n- not living up to his standards and expectations and he had very high standards and very it wasn't expectations as such but he had very high standards which he maintained and which he um, meticulously followed okay so uh, is there anything or uh, one sentence or a phrase which your father has told you and which is still your ply in your life i'm sorry any phrase or anything which your father has told you or taught you mm. you still apply in your life today Well I think the only thing I I I I I can recall really speaking um just before he um we had a very formal relationship and just before he died maybe a um, few months before he died uh he, he told me you know, really I would say a point of weakness uh, he said Nanda I'm proud of you and all that you've done 
and I was then an air vice, I was then air vice marshal, and uh, he was virtually on his deathbed at the time. He passed away two months later, and that um, certainly um, made me feel very good. Very nice. You know, I'd lived up to his expectations. Okay. Good, sir. Uh, sir, w how about when when you joined the air force? Uh, what sort of obstacles did you face? and how successful did you become? Well, actually, when I joined the Air Force, I didn't really have any, uh, uh, there were no obstacle, obstacles at all. The Air Force was a totally um, objective service. They may have known that my father was then uh, General Karyapa, but that had no effect or uh, influence upon how I progressed in, in, um, in the service. I believe that in the Air Force, uh, uh, one sort of advanced and progressed on the basis of one's own merits. And uh, the fact that I, when I did retire as Air Marshal, it was because of what I had achieved in the 40 years that I'd been a commissioned officer. So you served for 40 plus years? Or 40 well, yes, yeah. 40 uh, plus years. We've included my training period, it was about 43 years, but as a commissioned officer, about 40 years, okay. yes. So how, is, is it any different from uh, as the Air Force training or any sort of discipline, has it changed from the time you have been there or is it still the same? Is it consistent? Oh, I'm sure it has changed. I mean, you know, I've been retired from the Air Force for 23 years now. And today, if I were to go back, as I did two years ago, I went to attend a squadron um, significant anniversary. And I found I was a fish out of water because they're talking a different language. They're high tech, they're dealing with uh, computers and uh, and everything that that involves whereas in 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 uh, in, uh, in my years what we were known as uh, the, there was a common phrase called stick and throttle all that mattered was that you use the stick to get airborne you use the throttle to increase your power and things like that but it's changed a lot and i'm sure the uh, training regimen training syllabi are extremely um, rigid and tuned to the requirements of today's uh, war fighting uh, 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 capabilities. Sir, uh, we were talking about your life and your father. And uh, now the interesting part comes. What are the planes you have flown? Uh, you, what are you, the planes you have flown? Oh, I'm very fortunate. I, I flew, um, uh, we started uh, our flying training on one of in, uh, the HAL's more successful offerings to the Air Force, something, an aircraft known as the HT2, it was a single engine piston aircraft, tandem seater. Then I flew the, the Texan, it's a, an American uh, aircraft, again tandem seater, and having got my commission, I flew the Vampire. I went to a Vampire squadron, uh, flew Hunters, and uh, in the 65 war, uh, when I was injured and I was uh, medically um, uh, unfit to fly aircraft with ejection seat, I then converted to fly helicopters, and I commanded a helicopter unit, uh, during the Bangladesh war and after I got my I was reinstated in my f full flying category I went back to flying hunters for a brief period and then I went and commanded a, uh, a MiG-21 squadron um, at the end of that I was posted to various types of uh, various bases and I would fly the aircraft that were available on, on that base very interesting sir so when, when, when you use, use your flying time. Uh, when you spoke about computers and it was more like stick and throttle, uh, how, was, how was your experience? Because now everything is computerized and ev everything is uh, command based. Those days it was more like manual and analog. It was, yes. Yeah. How, how, how was it? How was the experience? Well, you know, it, it, there was a saying in the Air Force, uh, you flew by the seat of your pants. In other words, you flew uh, as you as you felt comfortable and uh, you, re you went by what the in gauges told you and they were all analog gauges in, in those years. Today you've got everything going for you by way of whether it's um, black boxes, whether it's a question of a, what they call a multifunction display, a glass cockpit a and uh, you've got computers are telling you what to do all the time but basically and eventually it's the man behind the machine and recently when uh, young um, um, what's your name? Avinandan shot down that aircraft, uh, flying a relatively uh, inferior aircraft to the F-16. It was a man behind the machine that did it and, and, and uh, nothing else. And that will always be the bottom line, as, uh, at least as I see it today. Now, of course, times and things have changed, but whether you get into close combat with an enemy aircraft, 
then it depends on how you maneuver and how good or bad your, your flying capability is. Okay. So you said you've been part of wars. How many wars have you been part of? Virtually, um, well actually I would say virtually, actually two. Uh, the 1965 war against Pakistan and uh, 1971 against Bangladesh. Okay. So how was the atmosphere in, 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 in the dressing room when you leave to fly a plane? And when you know that you, you might not return, you what's a, what's you, you a don't, words? You don't think about, I might not return. That's okay. furthest from your mind. You're, you're, uh, I mean, you find you're apprehensive. You could be a little scared of what am I going to experience with. But you're not, you're never, you never question yourself. I'm saying, uh, am I going to come back or am I not going to come back? No way. And in, in fact, uh, the moment you start having that in the back of mind, it's almost like saying you get up and uh, get off, get up, get into an airplane and take off. And you say, Am I going to come back and land? Uh, any one of 500 different things can happen, but it's beyond your control. But if you have this attitude of saying, oh, ifs and buts and things like that, then I'm afraid we're not going to get anywhere. Excellent thoughts, sir. So this is always the atmosphere in, in the dressing room for you guys? Oh, yes, you don't think about it. You, 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 you are prepared. First of all, you're told, don't believe it can't happen to you. When I say it can't happen, that you will not be faced with an emergency. And you must be prepared for it. Every morning before flying started, a, um, there was what they called a MET briefing, telling you the air crew what the weather was going to be like. And somebody would then after that get up and say, throw a question to the crew pilots present of how would you deal with so-and-so emergency. And this is one thing to do it in, in, uh, during MET briefing. But it was something that you also will live through day in and day out in your squadrons. And before you went up for a sortie, you were briefed and as many contingencies as were possible were discussed and say, how would you handle this? How would you do that and run out of fuel, bad weather, so on and so forth. And uh, it, it was ingrained into you. So you have been in injury, as you said, and uh, you have also been a prisoner of war. Uh, what was, how was your experience? Well, in, uh, there was a great deal of uh, uncertainty. The, there's a fear of the unknown. <clears throat> no one till, you know, really, um, uh, shall I say, um, conditions you to say you could become, you might become a prisoner of war. However, you are, well, when you get airborne, you sort of, uh, you, um, you carry a, a revolver with you uh, for self-defense in case you are captured or are forced to um, uh, abandon your aircraft. Uh, and um, uh, probably some amount of currency, of, uh, in, in our case, flying against Pakistan, some park currency. But uh, beyond that, nothing, because language no, was no issue at all. But in, uh, for example, in the Second World War, when pilots were flying, uh, whether it was in Germany or whether it was here in Japan, they, they were given what was known as blood money. They carried a flag and uh, in, on which was written in various languages that so-and-so is an allied airman, he wants support, this, that, the other. And this was read to whoever was your, your captor. And you use the money there to, to uh, perhaps uh, so ease your way around. Of course, there was the other way, other way of looking at it. Like, and unfortunately, it happened. Uh, uh, it happened. I think it didn't happen to any Indians in the '65 war, but it happened to uh, in uh, this recent uh, fracas on the 27th of uh, uh, February, when uh, uh, this plane that Abhinandan shot down, the air crew ejected, and uh, whether, I think there were two two pilots in that aircraft. Uh, one of them was beat, uh, badly beaten up by his own countrymen, we are told, and this is a hearsay, uh, because he was considered, to, uh, they didn't know whether he was an uh, Indian or a Pakistani. And he was, he was beaten back in blue, realized, he was saved by the army, realized, and then taken to the hospital where he died, and one chap survived. In Abhinandan's case, I think there was an attempt to, um, to beat him up, but fortunately, he was very close to a Pak army unit, and they came to a rescue and, and, um, and saved him. So you have been a prisoner of war. How long have you been a prisoner of war? Oh, not for very long at all compared to um, time frames of the Second World War, Vietnam. I, I, only for four months to the date. But uh, how were you treated? Uh, well, uh, I, I, I'll put it like this. We were not treated. I was not treated badly. We were not treated badly. There was no special treatment where I was concerned. The medical facilities were, medical aid was um, forthcoming and good. Uh, and I think as good as you could get in the Indian uh, uh, Armed Forces Hospital. Uh, the food was bad, the clothing was uh, inadequate. I spent a considerable amount of time for reasons I don't know 
in solitary confinement. Well, uh, that is a pretty low period in one's life, uh, uh, being in solitary confinement. But the moment you get back in, into an environment where you've got fellow Indians who are also prisoners of war, then because you share the same um, uh, challenges and, and difficulties and hardships, uh, everything d d disappears and uh, you, uh, you a great deal more by way of confidence uh, comes into you. Okay. So, but uh, <coughs> one question is, when uh, the army commander of the Pakistani armed forces called your dad and he said, uh, like, your son is with us, don't worry about him. Your father said, they're all my sons. How did you feel when he said that? I didn't know. I was a prisoner, number okay. one. Number two, it was not the army chief, the Pak army chief who called my father, I'm told. Uh, this is here, said I, that my father happened to be in Delhi at the time this war was going on. And um, when it was learned that I was a taken prisoner of war, a uh, message obviously went to general headquarters and to Ayub Khan. And uh, the ambassador, you know, high commissioner in the Pak, high commissioner was told, uh, contact uh, General Karyap and tell him that his son is well, he's being well looked after, and if he wishes, we'll send him back. And um, my father is supposed to have said, now this is all here, said I said I wasn't there. They're all my sons. Uh, treat them equally well, and um, repatriate my son w when the other prisoners are being repatriated. End of story. So did did you ever talk to your dad about that? Your father about that? No, never spoke no. to dad about that. Uh, so how did you deal with the trauma after you came back? As you said, solitary confinement. You you've been in solitary confinement for some time. You did face some emotional trauma. Mm -hmm. How did you? Uh, how did you come out of it and what sort of ways? Actually, wasn't it wasn't all that traumatic when you come to think of it because you sort of condition yourself and uh, um, in any which way you can. And after I got back, uh, you sort of almost, it's like uh, putting your foot into a well used shoe. Life has got to carry on, it's not the end of the world. And it would just so happen that um, because I was in low medical category, unfit to fly uh, any aircraft at that time, um, I was um, appointed to a desk job. I served uh, as ADC to um, then finally became Marshal of the Air Force Urgency. And um, um, th that was it. So the, 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 the trauma of, uh, it wasn't really a, a mental trauma that one experienced in that sense of the word. And um, for example, I, I would uh, commend you to read um, about this uh, American senator who died fairly last year. Uh, John McCain. He was a naval officer and he was in prison for five and a half years, a Vietnamese prison. He was tortured, he was badly t uh, treated. Um, he, he suffered a great deal of indignities and pri privations. At times, it only changed somewhat, I think, when uh, the uh, Vietnamese learned that it was his, his father was a, a four-star admiral commanding the Pacific Fleet. And, and hi guys. And um, and so he um, then um, uh, things changed a little bit, but he certainly had a, a, a very rough, difficult time. Uh, so, how was the war between Bangladesh, and what what are the challenges you had to face? Well, the war in Bangladesh was a very different uh, kettle of fish compared to 1965. For one thing, I was. Um, flying helicopters, I was commanding a helicopter unit. And in initial stages of war, my unit uh, and I was involved only in terms of casualty evacuation and communications. Communications meant taking senior officers from one um, place to another. However, after the 10th of uh, thereabouts of uh, December, uh, I went off to Agartala and from where there were at least 10 or 12 other MI4 helicopters operating from two other units and we were now used to uh, heli lift in a leapfrogging um, uh, um, operation troops across the, the rivers in Bangladesh and by so doing uh, got the Bangladeshis, by, the Pakistanis by surprise and I think it hastened the end of the war to the 16th of December and on the 16th or 17th is when uh, Niazi finally surrendered. But uh, uh, this was early, relatively speaking, a fairly benign operation. You took troops 10, 12 with their equipment, went across the river, got them off, you came back and you kept repeating this maybe five, six, seven, eight times a day. A day. And um, in this matter we were able to 
beef up uh, Indian forces uh, as they approach to uh, surround and attack Dhaka. Okay. So there's, there's always losses when it comes to war. Um, like when, when a person sacrifices his life for a country, what sort of uh, feeling goes through each and every one in the unit? Well, for one thing, it's never known, never looked upon as an individual sacrificing his life. He's not doing this intentionally. He's doing, he gets, just because he gets killed, it has, it's the ultimate uh, supreme sacrifice. The sacrifice possibly really would apply more in the case of the army, where a, an officer or a, a, um, a person below officer rank uh, finds that his, um, his picket is being overrun or his colleagues are, or his, uh, 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 the troops with him are in danger of being um, uh, overcome by the enemy. Then he sort of stands up and he takes his machine gun, whatever, and charges him. That is sacrifice. But in the in an operation of war, as a, as a pilot, uh, if I get killed, it's not a sacrifice. I'm doing my duty, full stop, and it's never looked upon. And you're not told uh, before you get airborne to say, oh, you, "A, you um, you may not come back. B, you're doing this for the for the country." You're doing this, you're, you're sacrificing. No, you, you're doing it for the country by all means, just keep the enemy away. But you never looked upon it, you, know, you don't look upon it sort of as a defeat, as I had to say that you're sacrificing your, your life or yourself for, for the country. No, not, not in the Air Force at any rate. Okay. Perhaps even not even so much in the Navy as it is particularly so in, in the Army. So if, if people do lose their life, is there any sense of uh, revenge? Like, no, I have to get back at them? It depends a lot. Uh, a lot depends on uh, the circumstances in which a, um, a person has been killed. And <clears throat> um, there is this very close, tight bond, if, again I'm talking about the army, between troops in a, in, in a company, in a, in a battalion, and things like that. That bond is not so much in the Air Force, because um, uh, you, you are the, the, the relationship, let us say, uh, between in the Air Force is where a few fight the enemy, the major portion stays by to make sure aircraft are serviceable, that your facilities, whether it is radar and things like that, are available to recover airplanes. In the Army, it's the other way around. It's, uh, if you take an infantry battalion, we may have about, say, 800 troops with 20 officers. So you can see the large uh, ratio difference there. And, uh, but because of this very close knit bond and because the, the Indian Army officer is taught that he, it's his country and his, um, uh, and his men under him that are paramount and most important that they will give their life to protect uh, or to, to um, shall I say, uh, seek revenge uh, in case their officer has been uh, uh, killed. At what age did you marry? 25. 25. Uh, do you have children, sir? Yes. Uh, how successful are they? Sorry? How successful are they? Well, two girls. Um, uh, the One is a homemaker. She tried her hand really seeing it didn't really work out enough. The other is, um, uh, she is into, she's a consultant in home furnishings and things like that. Happy enough. Okay. Now, um, we spoke about your father last week. And uh, you, you, you said what sort of person he was. How were you as a father to your children? Well, I think I have um, mellowed over the years and um, I think in the latter part of my life as much as theirs, the last say 35 years or so, uh, I think I've become a better father than I was before. I'm more understanding, uh, certainly a great deal more caring and affectionate. And uh, my two daughters are the apple of my eye. Very nice, sir. Um, so, w at what age did you retire? I retired at, at the age of 58. 58. In 1996. Okay. And how is life after retirement? Because you have been an active airman, and you have you have done so many things in in the, in the air force. And after retirement, how has it been? Is, has it been slow? Or oh no, life after a time being actually first class. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, I've in, in been able to <coughs> indulge in one of my passions, <coughs> excuse me, which is trekking. And more or less 
every year since I retired, I've trekked either in and around um, Kurugu or either in Nepal or in uh, Ladakh or in Uttarakhand. Um, so uh, that has, um, you know, keeps me going, it pumps adrenaline into me. Uh, I've also been able to do some amount of writing on uh, environmental is issues, on uh, affair, uh, uh, issues involving concerning international relations. And I did, um, I was invited by the US government to do a study with a Pakistani Air Force Air Marshal uh, on what we call CBM's confidence building measures to try and create a healthy, friendly environment between our two countries. We were in New Mexico for four months. We, he and I got on very well. Um, since then, unfortunately, because of, I, I think, really a prudence than anything else, we haven't really been in touch. <coughs> and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, uh, so, yeah, life has been very satisfying and uh, I have absolutely no complaints. I'm grateful that my father bequeaths this house, which is our home. And um, beyond that, uh, uh, for, as, as a pastime, as I said, I just do read quite a lot. Uh, and uh, I did uh, some amount of angling, which I haven't done now for some years. Uh, in terms of pastime, Again, I did play some golf, which I haven't for a year or two because of an injury. But uh, I hope to get back to it. And um, uh, uh, retirement has been very rewarding and fulfilling. And the other very major important factor is that when I retired uh, as Air Marshal, uh, my pension was an absolute pittance. And uh, compared to what I'm getting today, 23 years on, in the same rank, my uh, it's gone up uh, almost uh, almost sort of uh, 25 times 30 times so um, and uh, i'm able to i do i don't have any coffee state nothing at all i just got forests around us as you may have observed when you rode in but um, uh, i'm able to maintain a reasonable quality of life uh, i don't want any more and i'm grateful to uh, god and to um, or whomsoever, that, that um, uh, I'm able to, as I say, maintain a quality of life. And grateful to my, I don't have a photograph of your of fathers, of, of having inculcated in me a set of values. And I'm grateful to the three or four people who I've always considered my role models. And uh, my father was my idol, he was never a role model as such, but he was my idol. But among my uh, role models, there was uh, uh, General Timaya. Uh, he and I, uh, same clan, same family. Uh, then there was uh, Chief Marshal Katre, uh, who I, on whose staff I served uh, um, in 1985. Unfortunately, he died in office. Uh, the third person who I sort of considered an icon and who uh, was my role model was um, he was then Air Chief Marshal Arjun Singh, who uh, many years later, after he demitted office, became, uh, was appointed to the rank of uh, Marshal of the Air Force. So basically, the, these three were really um, Jantamaj, uh, Marshal Katri, and Marshal of the Air Force were my, like I said, I put them on a pedestal and always look up to them. Very nice, sir. So you spoke about discipline. And this is a personal question. Um, before I could call you and ask you for an interview, everybody told me one thing. He's very particular about time. So when you tell a certain time, you need to be there. So how important is time, sir? Oh, very important because if you are punctual, you are showing a great deal of respect to the person you're meeting or who you give an appointment to, from whom you've sought an appointment. But if unfortunately, and, and this is sadly lacking in our country today, yes. the two things, punctuality, no one could care a damn about it. But I personally feel today the need of the hour in this country is discipline and we are totally lacking in it. In any sphere of activity. And uh, we take shortcuts. Um, we believe well, nobody is looking so I can do this, that and the other. And till such time as, you know, uh, when <coughs> uh, John Kennedy became President of the United States in 61 or whatever it was, he quoted from I think it was uh, Teddy Roosevelt's famous, speak softly but carry a big stick. 
in India, what we really need, you can speak, you may uh, speak softly, or you, in, in other words, people raise their voices, yes. but they don't carry a stick, and they believe that because I've raised my voice, I am, uh, you are in for, you're in for trouble. But you need to carry that big stick to instill and enforce discipline. Until that happens, uh, too much is taken for granted, I'm afraid. Excellent point, sir. Excellent thought. So what sort of advice would you give uh, the people or the youth who have the future in their hands uh, about the importance of time and discipline? Well, it's so, you know, I personally feel, and uh, I'm just echoing something that my, <coughs> my father believed in, was that um, he had suggested, uh, I think, either when he was commander in chief or after he retired, and he told Nehru, that we must get our youth to spend at least a year or two in the armed forces. Uh, it'll teach them dignity of labor, it'll teach them discipline, it'll teach them nationalism. And uh, Nehru wasn't very happy with that because he was trying to make a, uh, to create some kind of a, a, a militaristic society. And he said, no, uh, the bottom line is this, and I, I still say today that um, and I, whenever I interact with young men, like these two gentlemen here, uh, join the armed forces. Army name is a very good life. It's a wonderful experience. It's it's rewarding. You're paid well, you and you don't have to you know sign up for life, sign up for a short service commission. So much so that when you finally decide to find okay, I've had enough. After ten years, I want to leave. The kind of experiences that you have gained uh, will stand you in good stead when you're uh, seeking a job outside. Of course, uh, the important thing is that government has to come into this, and uh, when a lot of, uh, particularly in the army, young men are leaving the service at the age of 35, 40, 30, between that, they, they should be allowed to uh, find places to sidestep into either um, government appointments or uh, into other uh, avenues in, in civil street. So, you spoke about discipline, and uh, let's talk about patriotism. Uh, I personally feel there is two sorts of patriotism going on in the country right now. One is real patriotism. One is? Real patriotism. One more is misplaced patriotism. You've been a real patriot. Your dad has been a real patriot. What is patriotism according to you all? Well, I would see it. I think uh, one's duty, if I leave the supernatural God out of it, one's duty to country and the people with whom who you serve but essentially patriotism is duty to your country country above all and everything else as i, I think i quoted to you lord chetwood's uh, famous uh, maxim the uh, the safety honor and welfare of your country come first always and every time and if this is kept in mind well then you have your answer to how patriotism should be patriotism is not uh, flag waving it is by uh, standing up with the national anthem it's not patriotism it's just showing respect right. to uh, national symbols it's like in the armed forces at the time of sunrise or sunset when the when the colors are raised or when the colors are lowered you stand to attention and you salute if you're in, in uniform but that, that is not patriotism but that, that is respecting a um, uh, a symbol of your country and, and just because I um, uh, find I, I great, uh, get a, a, a great deal of pleasure and pride when the national anthem is being played and I sing you know, the words of Janaganwana. That again is not patriotism so much as uh, you know, pride in one's country. And that is the bottom line, have pride in your country. Look upon yourself and basically uh, as an Indian first and foremost. And anything else, uh, um, I don't know if it's relevant here, but there was this little anecdote about an American who was visiting New York, met, met up, was in New York, met up with his friend, uh, an Indian. Uh, so he said, uh, well, how was uh, your trip to India and did you have a good time? Did you meet many Indians? And the American turned around and told him, I didn't meet any Indians at all. He said, what do you mean you didn't meet any Indians? You went to India. No, I met a Punjabi, I met a Bengali, I met a Gujarati, I met a Maharashtrian, I met a Tamilian, but I didn't meet, nobody said I, I, I'm an Indian first. That is something that has to be inculcated. And today, uh, unfortunately, the sort of fissiparious tendencies of regional parties and uh, communalism and things like that are uh, really uh, heading, you know, causing uh, the, I won't say disintegration, that's too strong a word, I hope that never happens, but uh, the kind of uh, uh, social environment that you see today. 
I say my contention, if you ask me about patriotism, I look upon uh, my, my patriotism, I'm an Indian first, I'm from Kodugu, I am a Kodava, yes, but Kodugu also comprises a whole lot of other communities, Christian, Muslim, uh, uh, Gaudas, uh, and any of the other communities, whether these are four, you know, three or four major uh, communities that they are. Uh, and as long as, if we can all get to talk the same language and look upon Kodugu as our home, as our land, I think in the bigger picture then, uh, I India is our home and our land, and th that's where our patri patriotism should be uh, directed. Excellent thought, sir. Excellent thought. I think people should uh, ponder on the points which you have told about what is patriotism, and let's not... Uh, differentiate it state-wise or uh, caste-wise. Um, so the recent Pulwama attacks, uh, our soldiers lost, uh, lost their lives and there was a lot of uh, bad environment as well as to let's go against war, uh, let's fight, do all that. And lots of Kashmiris were beaten. What are your thoughts about that? Look at the Kashmiri people who are uh, down south or other parts of, of, of the country. They were beaten and asked to go back. And they've said, they've said, go back to Pakistan, or they were beaten because of you guys, this is happening. What are your thoughts about that, sir? Well, quite honestly, I haven't really given it too much thought, except I feel very sad that, um, first of all, the unpleasantness and the, the sort of uh, a jihadi spirit that has been infused among uh, misguided youth in, in, the, in the valley in Kashmir <coughs> has caused this um, animosity. A and just because he's a Kashmiri, He's a Muslim man, doesn't make him a bad man or a bad woman. And, uh, is, and sadly, oh, this whole this hysteria <coughs> that is created is all being whipped up, I, I think, for political ends and purposes. The, 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 how the um, subsequent to the, um, uh, the uh, Fulmama attack, how the uh, Air Force went to uh, Bagel Court in Shukak, uh, uh, the parties are saying, oh, oh all uh, aiming at the forthcoming elections, for God's sake. I mean, that there were previous opportunities when it, we had the wherewithal, but we didn't follow it up. Today, you've got a government or a leadership which takes, uh, you know, bites the bullet and says, fine, we'll do it. And maybe it's had a desired effect and an impact upon uh, uh, Pakistani thinking twice about what they want to do. And today, if Pakistan says, oh no, we, we hear our intelligence that, that India is wanting to go to war again, it's a lot of bullshit, if you'll excuse my French, because there's no question that India would want to go to war again in, in the run-up to the elections. In a, what for? What do we gain out of it? Fine, if, if there is a... <coughs> we instigated, if there is uh, something similar to the Pulwama uh, thing, I, I'm sure government will weigh consequences and take a appropriate decision at the appropriate time. Thank you for the thoughts, sir. Last, sir, uh, what sort of advice would you like to give our audience, the people of Kodobo? Well, I said, join the armed forces. Um, uh, it's a great life. It's, uh, it's a challenge. Uh, you get to travel all over the country. Uh, I was very fortunate. I have traveled from Kanyakumari to the Siachen Glacier and from the eastern extreme end of uh, uh, Arunachal Pradesh to the um, Kutch border and on the Arabian Sea. And uh, I've met people, I've interacted with people, to meet, and uh, as I said, very satisfying, very fulfilling. And I'm grateful for what I um, received from the Air Force. Thank you so much, sir. It has been a real honor and privilege to talk to you. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for being on our show. Thank you. Thank you for watching Time to Talk on Kugna News. Keep watching. <coughs> I'll get you more shows like this. Thank you.